Yeah. And the, the mathematic, uh, um, if we uh, make uh, proton mass plus uh, neutron mass is uh, less than uh, uh, nucleus mass. Yeah, exactly. A stands for the atomic mass. A, a stands for uh, uh, the atomic mass. We usually say the atomic mass. Um, probably more accurately, it's it's the um, the, the baryon number. Protons, protons, protons plus, new, plus neutrons. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I apologize to the people online. I, I just found out I was muted. So hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, maybe you don't want to hear me okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so we know we know that the mass of an atom, we know that the mass of an atom is is equal to the the mass of the nucleus plus all the electrons minus the electron binding energy. Right? Is this a big number or a small number? Yeah, negligible. We usually ignore it. Right. Yes. And so we put the mass of the atom in here, okay, and, and we'll just make a substitution. I, uh, be careful, I dropped C squared. We, we, we do this a lot because we almost always assume that the mass is MEV. But we just assume that you're multiplying by C squared. And in fact, in some advanced courses, we, we just say C is equal to 1. And so it makes it easy. Um, and so we can do the math here. Nuclear mass is protons plus neutrons minus V. Nuclear binding energy, and and then that's equal to this, and we drop the electron binding energy, and so we get this this last one, right yeah, here. It's almost equal. Yeah, yeah, almost yeah, almost exactly equal to um, you know six figures usually, um, and so the mass excess is negative, the binding energy is positive, so when the mass excess goes up, the binding energy goes down. Okay, so that's how we think of nuclear masses. We do this because it, it's convenient. It gives us convenient numbers. A mass excess is a pretty convenient number to understand. Okay, let's look at, this is just a table. You saw this table yesterday? Yes. Oh, yes. Table of isotopes. Right? But these colors, these colors, it's like a three-dimensional graph. You know, more intense color, bigger numbers. Yeah. This is like the binding energy for one nuclear model. Okay, we call this a, a liquid drop model because it's a it's a theoretical model of nuclear mass. Okay, so it's not not actually been measured. Right. I'll show you some measured ones. So so which nuclei here? If you had to guess, which isotopes are the most tightly bound? The one in the middle. The one in the middle. Yeah. Exactly. Like Thirty-five. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So so around, around iron and nickel. Yeah, uh, helium is, is pretty pretty tightly bound, but not yes. too tightly bound. So certainly in the middle here, these nuclei are more tightly bound there. Okay, absolutely right. By the way, someone mentioned um, um, the, the remember these lines we talked about yesterday. Uh -oh, remember what I called those? Very non-physical term. C is the atomic number. Yeah. Um, uh, C atomic <laughs> Right, but 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 the, for example, remember these lines that we looked at yesterday, the the, the magic numbers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah so. magic numbers. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to draw a line down the center of the table of the isotopes, and just plot the binding energy of the stable nuclei along that line. Okay. And so, if I do that, I will get a figure that looks like this. This is the Binding energy per nucleon as a function of mass. Okay, so 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 for example, iron is somewhere around here. Iron has a mass around 56 or so, and this is the binding energy divided by the number of nucleons. See, look, iron, iron is the most tightly bound. It's hard to take iron apart. Okay, um, we, we we get down here. It's easier to take some of these apart. Yes. It's, it's easier to take, but it's, it's hard. It takes mo the most energy to take iron apart. Yes. This becomes very, very important in astrophysics. Um, if, if you remember nothing else, it's important to remember that iron is the most stable atomic nucleus. We'll talk about why that is a little later on. Um, 
this question. Yes. Is are this uh, tightness of the arrow of the arrow iron related to the fact that as soon as a star it, it starts to produce it, it's like a sentence to death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, 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 yeah, you're absolutely right, and we'll talk about that. The binding energy of iron means that stars only only produce a maximum of iron. So if a, if a star is really big, its core will make iron, but nothing else. It's like what? Then it collapses. It's like it's a supernova. Some can be a black hole. And, and so one big question in astrophysics today is how all these heavier nuclei are made. Okay, um, and you can see some notes here. If I undergo fusion, I actually give off energy until I get the iron. Then, if I undergo fusion, I need to get more energy, heat, for example, from the star. By the way, what what is this little spike here? Uh, so 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 this little spike on the side here. Oh, yeah. Hydrogen. Uh, very, very, very close. Very close. Lithium, lithium. lithium. No, not, not lithium. Beryllium, boron, hey, helium. You're, helium. Yeah, you're like telling me all of them except the one. Helium. He, helium is 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 pretty tightly bound. Mm -hmm. That's going to become important later on as well, because a lot of stars burn helium. Okay, helium is hard to break apart. Um, however, you can take several helium particles and make bigger nuclei out of them, okay? Helium. Now, but, um, helium has two, two protons, two neutrons. Uh, very often you will hear me call helium an alpha particle, okay? That's a, we, 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 I, I use those interchangeably. I'll say helium, I'll say alpha particle. Okay, yes. now I showed you this. This is the nuclear binding energy for a theoretical model, what we call a liquid drop model. Now, if I were to go into a laboratory and measure nuclear masses, which I can do, uh, hopefully I'll have, have a chance to show you some experiments that we do to measure nuclear masses. And I take the masses that I, that I measure and I subtract the theoretical masses. If the theoretical masses were perfect, well, well I should get zero, right? Everything should be zero, right? Of course, no, no, no theory is, is ever perfect. Yes. Um, so if I make a graph of that, I get something like this. This is the binding energy. Of, it's a different model, but it's more accurate. Uh, of, of a more accurate model minus the liquid drop model. Um, zero is, is like this blue. The so negative numbers are purple. Positive is green, yellow, red. What do you notice most of all? Nickel. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Stop. Oh, stop. 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 Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You. You. Know, you yep. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the binding energy is actually higher than we think, right? Yeah. Or higher than we might have thought. Yeah. In some points. In some points. Yeah. So we used to think a nucleus was like a soup. You just put the ingredients in and they get all mixed up and it's nice and smooth. It turns out there are certain nuclei that are more tightly bound than others. And you pointed them out, nickel, tin, um, lead. And, and in fact, it almost looks like there's certain proton numbers because you can kind of see this little band here, right? Yes, it's a beak. Yep, and, and you can also see there's certain neutron numbers. Like a grid. But look at exactly like a grid. Have we seen these numbers before? Yes. Those magic numbers. Those are the magic numbers. Those are what we call the magic numbers. Magic because the nuclei are more tightly bound for those particular numbers of protons and neutrons. And those have extreme implications for astrophysics. And we'll see some of those implications. A nucleus that is more tightly bound um, uh, may not be may not decay radioactively as fast as one that is not as tightly bound. It may not undergo a neutron capture reaction as quickly as other nuclei. And so, so it tends to be more stable. It tends to live longer. Yes, question. Do we know why these particular numbers are 
Yeah, yeah, um, uh, I'm so glad you asked. Question is, is it, do, do, do we know these are the magic numbers, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me show you this slide here. Okay, we saw this already, right? Yeah. When somebody asked, what are these lines? I said magic numbers and I didn't say anything else, right? Okay. These are what we call closed shells. So you'll hear me say closed shells. You'll hear me say magic numbers. Okay. Um, the nuclei are more tightly bound. It, it's harder to break them up into pieces. Okay. Um, uh, because they're tightly bound, they decay. Yep. Could you repeat the why? What are the magic numbers? Um. Yep. Um. Um. So. So. Um, actually, I'll show you on the next slide. In fact. Okay. Yep. Um, I'll give you a list of them. So, have you ever seen anything in high school, mm -hmm. for example, where where you had something that was bound into shells that might have been had a filled shell, for example, might have been more tightly bound, um, might have taken a lot more energy to add another item to it. I know you have. Yes. Uh, how about electron orbitals? Yes. S, P, D, and F? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, nucleus, nuclear levels of energy. Yeah, exactly. Yep. When, when you study the electron orbitals, yeah. it's the same principle. Oh. Okay. When you completely fill an electron orbital, it takes more energy to add another electron. Yes. Same principle. Now, different model, but the same principle. In fact, we can apply that here. So, we call this the nuclear shell model. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like electron yeah, shells. You've seen this? Okay. In fact, when we, when we list nuclear shells, we use the same letters as for electron shells. So the lowest nuclear shell is S, P, D, F, G, H, I. And so on. Yes. Okay. Do you really DNA orbitals exist? Oh yeah, in, in nuclear physics I do. In fact, uh, we go all the way. I've seen is you, we can even measure them. Um, I exists. Uh, Professor Carabini, have you ever seen a J orbital in your experiments? How much do they have to be? They're not big. Not in my experiment, but those guys that study these high spin. Yeah, the highly deformed nuclei. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. That's uh, yeah. Yeah, a nuclear they're shaped like footballs or yeah, pancakes. Like, uh, and stuff. Uh, American football, not, not <laughs> European football. Which, uh, um, now, you won't talk, we're not going to talk about it too much now, but you're going to see this when you take quantum mechanics. Uh -huh. the harmonic, you, of course, you know what a wave harmonic function. oscillator yeah. is. Yeah. Wave yeah. functions. Yeah, exactly. Right? The first couple shells in a nucleus, the first couple energy levels in a nucleus, follow a harmonic oscillator potential. Okay, in fact, that's what, what this is on the right hand side. These are levels of a harmonic oscillator. Now, when you get the higher shells, higher, you, you can think of them as orbits, it, it deviates from a harmonic oscillator. Okay, the energy levels. And the reason is, is because Protons and neutrons also have what we call an angular momentum, yes. and they have a spin, and you can you can match them in certain ways to get slightly different energies. Okay, but this explains why this explains why there are certain shells here. Now, this is the harmonic oscillator right here. These are the the magic numbers in a harmonic oscillator. When you get up to 20, however, it's actually the next magic number is not 20, it's it's 28. Okay? And the reason is is because this energy level here is actually a little lower than we think. Because there's an interaction between the nuclear spin and the nuclear orbit. That makes it a little more tightly bound. Now, if you haven't taken quantum mechanics, you're gonna study this until you're sick about it. <laughs> um, you'll talk about quantum numbers eventually. But remember this, because you'll see quant uh, harmonic oscillator in your quantum mechanics courses later on, um, if, if you haven't already. And you can say, hey, we, we know about harmonic oscillator. Okay. 
But that's why some nuclei are magic, some are more tightly bound, some are not. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we've got this whole landscape so far. Um, we're not only getting into nuclei as just balls of protons and neutrons, we're getting into nuclei that actually have structure. They're actually assembled differently. And there's an entire field of astrophysics that revolves around nuclear structure. Okay. Uh, question so far? Can't spot any mistake. I'm sorry. I can't spot any mistake. Yeah, yeah. Um, for a harmonic oscillator, this is good. For the nuclear shell model, um, it's actually 28 here. Okay. Okay. Because this, this comes down a little lower. Yep. Now, there's another aspect of nuclear structure that I want to show you because this comes into play when we start talking about Big Bang nucleosynthesis and stellar nucleosynthesis. Um, do you remember what the most tightly bound nucleus is? Iron. iron, yeah. yeah. Uh, somewhere around iron, iron or nickel. Um, what was another tightly bound nucleus that we talked about? Helium. 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 Yeah. Two protons, two neutrons. Now, you can imagine taking helium and making bigger nuclei by taking several helium nuclei and stacking them together. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so we think of not just protons and neutrons, we think of stacking heliums together. Yes. But, but of course, the baryon number of, of those nuclei ha has to be what? Multiples of four. Multiples of four, exactly, right, exactly. Something with 27 wouldn't be, wouldn't uh, work. Yeah. And so here's an example. Again, uh, nuclear mass on the left-hand side as a function of, of, of baryon number. Uh, um, Excuse me, nuclear mass in terms of baryon number for these different colored lines mean different elements. Okay, so, so you've got helium, beryllium, uh, carbon 12, oxygen 16. We can make all of those nuclei by stacking helium nuclei yes. together, right? And in fact, if you look at it, they have pretty high binding energies. <clears throat> because when you stack helium nuclei together, they, they form bonds between them. Yes. Very similar to, say, electronic bonds, but helium nuclei are very tightly bound. Okay. Since they're very strong by themselves, the helium nuclei, together they form a stronger... Yeah, yeah, it, it, tends, to, yep, it tends to be more stable. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is a theory, this is called alpha clustering. Mm -hmm. um, this was studied pretty extensively uh, by people all over the world, um, in, including uh, um, uh, the great scientist Ikeda. Uh, who I had a chance to work with in Japan for, for a little while. Um, in fact, we'll look at one of his pictures here. And this is boring. This is interesting as well. Take a look at these. So, so beryllium has, has two helium nuclei, one bond between them, right? Um, carbon-13 has three, so three bonds. Oxygen-16. Neon only has nine bonds. Um, if, if you do the, 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 the combinatorics, you would say, well, it should have ten. But these two are too far apart, they don't touch each other, right? So, so, so we can think of neon like that. And if we plot the binding energy as a function of the number of bonds, we get this thing on the right-hand side here, and you can see it, it, it goes up linearly. Yes. So what I can say to myself is I can say, what if, what if I wanted to take a helium nucleus and turn it into a magnesium? I would add an alpha particle. And the binding energy would go up by the same amount. Every yes. time I add an alpha particle, the binding energy goes up by the same amount. Yeah, pretty, pretty close. Yeah. So, so if I told you the binding energy of oxygen, you could tell me the binding energy of silicon, roughly. Because you're just adding these alpha particles. Okay? And so the great scientist Ikeda. Uh, came up with what we call an Ikeda diagram. Um, that's on the right-hand side here. And he just said, let's say I have some nucleus, neon, uh, carbon, and I, and I want to break it up into three alpha particles. I have to add 7.27 MeV to that nucleus. Like somehow I have to excite the thing. Put it in a box and shake it up. Okay. If I have oxygen and I want to take an alpha particle off it, I get a 7.16. Pretty close, pretty close. 
And then if I want to take off two more awful particles, well, this minus this is 7.27. If I have neon and I, I want to take off an alpha, okay, it's it's less now. But then I get up the um, uh, car. I want to take off two alpha particles off of the neon. It's seven. This is about seven MeV or so. I want to take off more alpha particles. It's about 19 MeV, and so on. And I can play this game for for quite a while, which is really interesting. Um, what is the Unit of uh, 7.27. Uh, um, MeV, mega electron volts, a million electron volts. Yep, unit of energy there. Yeah. Nice, convenient unit of energy in nuclear physics because everything kind of runs at MeV. Mm -hmm. By the way, for, for chemistry, what kinds of energies do we deal with? Potential. Uh, potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and same, same here. Uh, we call that the nuclear potential. The electron potential is uh, about single EV, you know, 10 EV or so, you know, the amount of energy it takes to take off an electron. Here, we're talking about million electron volts. Yeah. And so, you know, here, here's, a, here's a cartoon. This is a cartoon here. It's, so it certainly doesn't look like that, but it gives you an idea, okay? At, at this point, um, uh, I know they have this in Europe, the, 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 the Lego bricks where you yes. put things together, because it was invented in, in the Netherlands. I'm sorry, may I ask something? So, the Netherlands invented, so. Um, okay, questions about... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? If I add more helium, uh, do I have to put extra neutrons to make the nucleo uh, stable? Oh, yeah, that's a good, oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, great question. Let's go back to this table here. Yeah. So, so you're saying, you know, if I make it out of helium, I can put only. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can only really go up this far, right? Yeah. Before it starts deviating, right? Okay. Now, the, there are nuclei here that I can make out of helium, and those, those do tend to be a little more tightly bound, but but because they're not stable, they they decay back to stable nuclei. It tends to break down. A Okay, not not too much. It's still a pretty good rule of thumb, but it does tend to break down a little when you get up there. Yeah, that that's a great question. And, and in fact, you can actually see it in, in this figure here. Um, the, you know, the, this isn't quite seven, right? To to, to take one off of a neon. You know, but um, here th this is not seven. You know, so when we start to get really high mass, at least for the the very very um, heavy nuclei. It, it breaks down a little, but when you get up here, it, it's um, pr pretty good. Yes, 31, 38, 7. So, uh, 7.27 is the energy needed to take off your half uh, particle? Roughly, yeah, roughly. Okay. For, 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 from a carbon, anyway. Yes, from, 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 from a carbon. carbon. And so, so if I wanted to you know, take every time I take off an alpha, it's it's about it's, you know it's it's about so it's not exact, but it's about seven. Here you can see we're breaking um, magnesium into two carbons, you know, which which is kind of halfway between here. Thirteen, yes. Which is interesting. Um, by the way, um, but beryllium has a mass of eight. Okay. It's worth noting that there are no stable mass 5 or mass 8 nuclei in nature. Okay. That becomes very, very important, um, uh, um, not just for stellar burning, but, but even for the formation of life. Yeah. If there were stable mass 8 nuclei, there wouldn't be nearly as much carbon in the universe mm. as, as we would like. So beryllium that could be a problem. Is the only stable that made, uh, No, beryllium's not stable. That's why I only drew it as two alphas here. You yeah, see yeah. that? It, you can never make a beryllium. It, 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 it decays very quickly into something okay. else. Yep. And that's worth remembering. No stable mass 8, no stable mass 5. No but boron 8 is unstable. Boron 10 is stable. 
lithium five is unstable. Lithium seven. Why five? Uh, it's a. I don't remember exactly at the moment. It's a particle physics right. um, answer, but I, I have to look that up and get back to you. No yeah. Okay. Here's where we are right now. Um, so, so we, we talked about um, uh, sort of some some basic definitions. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over and we'll start talking about what we call nucleosynthesis. How are the elements made? How is stuff made when we talk about nucleosynthesis? Um, it's one of the biggest questions in nature today and that uh, it, it's not just a question, it's a whole body of knowledge because there are different ways that we make elements. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to one, uh, the next slide. Um, we can go, I guess we go to, uh, Professor Carabini said about 5.30 today. Um, so uh, what I will do is while I switch over, if you need to take one minute to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water or something like that, we can do that. So we will take a you know, one or two minute or three minute break. Excuse me, is it possible to make a question or not about the... No, okay. Okay, so um, we talked about the basic so, sort of what we call nuclear structure, gave you a couple ideas. Uh, nuclei aren't just a soup where we put the protons and neutrons together. They have some structure to them. Some are more tightly bound than others. Some of them behave differently than others. Okay, and I showed you the table of isotopes many, many, many times. And you're going to have a chance to look at the table of isotopes yourself. Okay, um, this lecture is going to start talking about uh, um, the sources of elements, where they come from, how they are made. Um, today we're going to talk about nuclear reactions. And then if we have time, we're going to talk about the, the very first element formation in the universe, which was the Big Bang. It was very interesting stuff. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, same, same uh, QR code I showed yesterday. These are where the slides are. It's in the same directory. Uh, if you need to take a picture of it, go ahead and take a picture of it. And it looks like I see some cameras there. Yeah, everyone is really just texting their friends. They're not really taking pictures of them. All right. Um, now, some homework. Um, uh, 
you can go to this web page here, and here's the link for it, QR code. Um, this is an interactive table of isotopes. I actually use this all the time in my work. This was created by the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Vienna, Austria. Okay, And you can click on isotopes, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, and, and you can get all kinds of information on isotopes. And then take a look and see if you can try to answer th these questions here. Okay, try, try to find out the mass ex excess of molybdenum 108. Try to find out the half-life of sodium 25, for example. Um, tell me what the stable isotopes of zinc are. Okay, the ones that we're going to find in Earth. All right. Uh, kind of get used to using it. And of course, you can play with it. All right. Okay. And then, um, if you have time, take a look at the slides for day two. Uh, if we get to them, you can have some questions. Um, bring some questions with you. All right. Okay. Um, and more homework. No. For, for next week. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way, somebody asked yesterday, how will we know um, if this is biased towards your own network? Yeah, I will tell you, this is biased towards me. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is me telling you about myself, right? Okay. Because I'm the most important. No. <laughs> but you know, um, go ahead and, and read that article. Um, there is also a, uh, a link to um, uh, an archive article as well. This was uh, a paper that we just published very recently. Very interesting work. Me, really neat. Talks about some of the largest stars ever. Wow. You know, 100, 200 times the mass of the sun. And, Scooby. And from Scooby? Or from, Tanis Mayoris? Uh, I'm sorry? Was, was it from Scooby or Tanis Mayoris? Uh, I think Tanis Mayoris is, 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 is a, a large one. I can't remember the exact name. I, I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, now that you mention it, yeah. Um, so, so take a look at that. Uh, two five-minute article. It, it, it won't take you long. It won't take long to read it all. Okay. So today we're going to talk about um, uh, nucleosynthesis. All that means is how are elements made? Nucleosynthesis. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call thermonuclear reaction rates. Um, there's a lot of math in this part. Um, I will I will skip over most of the math. I will show you some of the math. We are great at math. Are you great at math? Okay. Well, the math is in the slide. Yes, it's on the So 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 you can you can read the math. But I'm gonna probably just say okay, there's a math and then go on. Okay. Um, it, it's beautiful math. It, it really is. But uh, um, just in the interest of time, it, I will try to give you a flavor. Okay? All right. We want to understand where the energy comes in stars, okay? The source of elements and, and how nuclear reaction rates are determined. Because nu nuclear power is, is, is really what powers the universe here. Okay? Um, we saw this yesterday. Yeah. All right. So I will review. Um, now, once again, this is a, a table of elements, periodic table, yeah. uh, and they're colored by where we think these elements come from. Okay, so there are many, many different places that these elements come from. Hot hydrogen was made entirely in the Big Bang. Helium was mostly made in the Big Bang. A little bit of lithium. Okay, you, you see when we get up to, to, to mass five, no Big Bang elements. At mass spot. This this kind of makes a, 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 a bottleneck, if you will. It makes it difficult yes. to, to make heavier elements in the Big Bang. And then stars can fuse these heavy elements. Of course, the, the, the sun can 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 make some uh, uh, mostly helium, at least the way it is. Maybe the sun will make a little carbon later on, near the very, very end of its life. Usually you gotta be a little more massive to do that. Okay. So the question for you is, um, what, what, what powers stars? And th this is actually a difficult question. Can you repeat? Yeah, what, what, what powers stars? Fusion. Yeah, f we, we seem to think fusion. That, it's, it's actually quite difficult to answer. Um, historically, 
it was thought that when the sun formed, it was this ball of dust that collapsed under its own gravity. Okay. Now, now, what's happening to the potential energy, the gravitational potential energy? Gets increased, greater and greater. Um, so if I have matter out here and it comes in smaller, um, yes. the gravitational potential energy d decreases, right? Decreases. Oh. And and then that energy has to go somewhere, right? Yeah. And it becomes right. So so people used to think that well, um, you can actually power the sun just by it collapsing onto itself. Okay. Now you actually get a lot of energy from that, but the question is, is that collapse of a star a star is that collapse of dust into a star what powers it? Okay. And people thought that for a long time. We can do a very quick. We can do a very quick calculation here. Okay, take a look. Um, so, so, so first of all, take a look at the right-hand side here. The, the solar luminosity, that's, that's, that's how bright the sun is. Um, units are watts, just like a light bulb, okay? Uh, how, how much energy is it putting out? That, this we know, we measured this, okay? We know solar masses, very good. Uh, we know how big the sun is. So we can say, the solar luminosity, let's assume it's constant. We could say if we take the solar luminosity and we take all the gravitational potential energy and turn it into light from the sun, how long will the star burn for? And that's an easy, that's an easy thing. We can do that on the left side here. Um, the solar luminosity times time, uh, watts times time gives me energy, right? Yeah. Um, how much energy? Well, gravitational potential energy of a sphere. That, that's this right here. Okay, okay this, is, this you probably very much saw. Um, so we can figure out how long the sun burns. So if, if the sun burns, if stars burn only by gravitational potential energy, it is a lot of energy. That's a lot of energy, and it does produce a lot of heat. And in fact, it can, can make the star survive for a long time. But if it were purely that, we would have a solar lifetime of, of 15 million years. Is that good? A bit small. How old do we think the solar system is? Uh, five million, million years. Yes. Four and a half, five billion years, yep, yep. So, so, so it, it, it can't be purely yes. gravitational potential energy. Now, now Gravity has a lot of energy, but there's got to be something else. Yes. Uh, why, uh, why don't we measure luminosity in candles? Yeah. Um, oh, um, candles. I think candles is a unit of luminosity. Um, SI units, watts. So, um, if you're an astronomer, you'll probably use ergs per second. And I, I can never remember what an erg is in astronomy. This is why it's hard to talk with nuclear physicists and astronomers. Uh, measure of power. Measure of power, yeah. Energy per second, right? And why, why should luminosity be measured in power? Because the sun is continuously feeding photons to the earth, right? There's always energy over a period of time, right? Does that make sense? This left-hand side, would be like the energy over the entire lifetime of the sun, sure, from the time it's born till the time it dies. And by the way, you can do simulations of this. You can take take the sun and simulate it on a computer, and then turn off the fusion and see what happens. And and it's quite interesting. It's it's interesting to watch. Um, and so. So it can't be gravity. Um, what about chemical reactions? Well, you can do a calculation here. Uh, chemists do this all the time. Assume that the sun is made of, uh, say, enough hydrogen and enough oxygen to, to burn into water. Pretty, pretty large energy releasing reaction. It would have a lifetime of about 50,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. So even worse, okay? So, and they used to think, you know, the sun was just made out of wood and it was on fire, um, which was <laughs> fascinating, but no. Okay, and so as you told me, um, we had hints very early on that that 
stars that things happen at the nuclear level in space. Um, we found technetium in stellar spectra. Okay. Yep. So you look at you look at light that comes from a star, yeah. and elements in the atmosphere of that star will absorb certain frequencies. Yes, and you can. Uh... Yep. Or they may even emit certain frequencies. So uh, you've seen the absorption spectrum. You see these dark lines in the spectrum. So we know what technetium looks like. Technetium has a half-life of four, just over four million years, which is very, very, very short. Okay. And 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 we know stars live way longer than that. So somehow that technetium had to get there. Okay. Um, aluminum twenty-six, and this is a really interesting element in nuclear astrophysics. Um, you, you'll, you'll see nuclear astrophysicists who spend some time talking about aluminum-26. We try to find it in meteorites. Yeah. Um, it has a half-life of, of um, not quite one million years. We, we can use it to date things. Um, uh, yes. It's made by cosmic rays, too. Okay. Um, rays from outer space might hit an isotope of aluminum and, and spall off a neutron and, and make aluminum-26. We found aluminum-26 in stellar spectra as well. Very short half-life. It, certainly it had to get there somehow, and it has to keep being made in order for us to see it. Okay? Another thing, and this is what they do very, very well here in Italy, and specifically uh, um, at, this, at this university, is neutrinos. Um, we, we, We've seen neutrinos produced by the sun. Yes. Neutrinos are produced in nuclear reactions. That's the only thing that can make nuclear reactions. And then, this is also interesting, type 1a supernova. These might be white dwarfs, um, maybe a binary system of white dwarfs, or maybe a white dwarf that is accreting matter from another star. Um, the cores of them uh, uh, undergo a, a thermonuclear runaway and they explode into what we call a type 1a supernova. Well, when we look at the light spectra as a function of time, you know, they might look like this cartoon. This is a logarithmic scale. I don't have numbers. Oh, yeah. it, it's a cartoon, but it's logarithmic. And so, but you can see the light goes away after, you know, less, well under a year, the light has decayed away. And the half-life that we see of the light curve is about 5.3 years. The same as the decay of cobalt-60. And so all of these point to give us some sort of indicator that there are nuclear processes going on in, in multiple environments in space. Normal stellar burning is nuclear. Uh, stellar explosions are nuclear. Cosmic evolution somehow has a nuclear process. So this, this was, um, these are fascinating findings. This is really what drives the entire field of, of yes. nuclear astrophysics. Okay. Let's talk about energy generation in stars. Energy generation. So, um, quick review. You've seen this already on the left side. Nuclear binding energy, right? You, you've seen that. You know that the mass of a nucleus is less than the mass of its components yes. added up. Okay. Um, on the right side, what if I have two nuclei? I have one atomic nucleus, another atomic nucleus, and they interact. Okay. They undergo a reaction, just like in chemistry. Okay. In fact, the notation is the same as chemistry. Okay. If I have two nuclei, let's say, and I just label them, I give them a label A and B, they, they don't mean anything. If I have two nuclei, A and B, and they react and they produce two other nuclei, C and D, um, the masses may not be the same on both sides of the equation because we know that the nuclear masses are not equal to the sum of all of the baryons in a nucleus. So there may be a mass difference. Where does that extra mass go? Heat. Energy. 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 Yeah, it could make heat. That's how nuclear reactors work, right? It could make heat. Um, goes into energy for sure, right? And so we call that the Q value. I believe chemistry has a similar term. Okay? 
So Q is the energy in excess. Uh, the, the That's exactly it. Q is the energy excess in a nuclear reaction. I believe chemistry has the same thing. It's been a long time since I took chemistry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, chemistry is really hard. <laughs> Never go into chemistry. <laughs> how, how do we figure out this Q value? How do we figure out how much energy is released in a reaction? Well, we, we subtract the masses, right? Yeah. Or we can subtract the mass excesses. Or we can subtract the binding energy and do what? Make it ne make it negative, right? Yeah. Because the mass excess is directly proportional to the binding energy, but yes. negative, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So if if a reaction has a positive Q value, it releases energy. Uh -huh. Okay. It's endo endo exo. Um, this this is this is wrong, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's wrong, wrong because, because uh, if it spreads a lot of heat, it's, it's an exothermic. Yep. Like yeah. a, a sodium into water, yep. for example. So, so these are these are reversed. Yeah. If a reaction releases energy, it's exo exothermic. If you if it absorbs energy, it's endothermic. Do you remember the the figure I showed you with the binding energies as a function of nuclear mass? Which nucleus had the highest nuclear mass? Uh, highest binding energy? Iron. 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 Yes. If I want to assemble nuclei together um, and I'm making heavier and heavier nuclei, I'm giving off energy, right? Yeah. yeah. What if I want to make even heavier nuclei? What's yeah. happening? Uh, it's endothermic, exactly. It's releasing yeah. Releasing. It's, releasing, it's releasing energy until I make iron. And, um, then after I make iron, it needs energy, right? Yeah. Can you, can you start to understand how stars can only make iron? Mm -hmm. They can't continue to give off energy if they're fusing heavier nuclei. Yeah. Okay. So they cannot go over, over a certain iron. amount. Exactly. They, they, make, uh, heavier nuclei iron. they can't continue to burn. We'll talk about what happens when a star makes iron. Because we've got to figure out how stars make heavier elements, right? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, just some, some definitions here. Maybe you've seen these. These are. Uh, this is just some uh, vocabulary. Just some reaction types. By the way, uh, the vocabulary is is quite fluid. Um, once you've done this a while, you, you know what people are talking about. Sometimes we don't use these words all the time. Sometimes they're uh, a little different. But, but fusion just means I take two nuclei and squish them together and ma make a third one, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, gamma is a, a, a uh, photon. A photon. Uh, yeah. We use it generally to mean photon. So a lot of times that Q value will go into a gamma ray, right? All right. So it's, uh, it forms a C nuclei and nucleus mm -hmm. plus energy. Yeah, plus, so plus energy, yep. Electromagnetic reactions involve a photon. Yeah. So I might have a nucleus and a photon hits it and breaks it into something else. Breaks it into two nuclei. Sometimes I'll have a nucleus and a photon hits it. This star means it's excited. Okay. Oh, yeah. it's, it changes to a different energy level. Just like in chemistry, electrons can move to upper energy levels. You can do the same thing with atomic nuclei. You can increase their angular momentum somehow. You can take a proton and move it to a different energy level. You can increase its spin. Sometimes you can uh, deform the nucleus. There's multiple ways of exciting it. When I took my first nuclear physics class, um, uh, we asked the professor how you excite the nucleus, and he said, ah, you just kick it. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but close. Um, yeah. Nuclear decay is just where I have one nucleus. And it undergoes. You've, you've probably heard of beta decay, alpha decay. It's like yeah. Yeah. Yep. This is a form of beta decay. A nucleus turns into another nucleus. Beta minus. Yeah. It turns a neutron 
turns a neutron into a proton in that nucleus. It gives off an electron. Antineutrino. Anti Antineutrino. Anti yep, antineutrino. There's also beta plus decay. There's a electron catch there, which are like the opposite. Alpha decay is a type of decay. Um, you'll see this a lot for the very, very heavy nuclei. You'll see a, 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 a let's see, a, a thorium-228, alpha decay. That's a very popular one. Okay. Uh, uh, uranium decay chain, yeah. Yeah. Um, probably worry about radon. Radon. Yes. My house, actually, where I live, we worry about radon because there's a lot of granite underneath the the dirt, and and granite has a lot of uranium in it, which actually decays, uh, becomes radon, and goes through this whole decay chain, and becomes uh, um, some other stuff. But and anyway, it becomes radon, which is a gas, and it gets into your house. So we always measure the radon. And the reason this is the reason this is bad is because you can inhale radon, and then it uh, goes the alpha particles go into your lungs. It's and, toxic. Yeah, it doesn't have vitamins or anything in it. It's bad for you. Oh, let's see. Uh, fission is just where a nucleus splits into two nuclei that are more or less equal in shape, not quite, and not always, but close. Quite often, it gives off a lot of neutrons. Um, spallation is, is, is really kind of like a special kind of fission. It's where you might have a reaction uh, between a nucleus and another nucleus, or a proton or neutron, possibly even a photon, and it just breaks the nucleus up into a, a, into a bunch of parts. Yeah. It's really, um, uh, a lot of heavy ion people will do spallation reactions. So, for example, they might take a tin and a tin and collide them, and, and it just blows everything up. Okay. Um, and, and then also very important are, are scattering reactions, where you have a nucleus that, that just bounces off another one. Usually a proton, a neutron, or an electron, or an alpha particle. Um, it, it, if there's no change in energy, what kind of re what kind of reaction is that? Nothing changes. Yeah, elastic. We call it elastic. Um, you may leave a nucleus in an excited state. It's, it would be like inelastic, for example. So it's like billiards. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, you know, and in this case, it would be billiards where, where one of the balls gets bigger or smaller. Or something, so, okay. That's not a, a very good ball to be hit. To no, no. Okay, um, so just keep this vocabulary in mind. Um, it's You'll hear us use, for example, I hear people talk about scattering, um, where it, it's not quite like this. Maybe you have something else that comes out, or they might call... You know where maybe this comes out, but then the B breaks out. You, you, you'll hear people interchange, but anyway, you'll hear these words periodically. You, you'll hear other words, but these are kind of the main ones here. Um, now, in a reaction, so you know from chemistry, in a reaction, the stuff on the left side has to equal the stuff on the right side, right? Okay. Um, so, what are things that have to be conserved in a reaction, for example. Energy. Energy. energy has to be conserved, right? Even if that energy goes into mass. a photon or a mass, right? Mass in the chemical reactions. Mass? Does mass have to be conserved? Uh, no. I don't think. Theoretically speaking, I think, yes. Uh, energy has, uh, mass has energy, yes. But yeah, we're, we're living in the quantum world, right? Where mass and energy really are the same thing, right? Yes. Momentum. Momentum should, should be conserved. Well, the angular and the. Uh, Any, anything else needs to be conserved? Momentum. Okay. Here's a table. Some conserved quantities. Ch charge, right? You have to have a single amount of charge on the left and right hand side. So, so, for example, look at this, which turns a, a neutron into a proton. Proton has a positive charge. Well, the electron gives me a negative charge here. And, and because we have to conserve momentum, somebody invented a neutron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he, he said, you know, somehow we need to conserve momentum, and of course, 
when, when he wrote that up, everyone said, ah, you're, you're wrong. Okay, let's invent a new article. That yeah, was you, yeah, in fact, I think the quote was, I, I can't remember who said it, I think it was Heisenberg might have said, who ordered that? And, and, um, he was right. He was absolutely, he had to be right, right? Um, baryon number, right? same number of protons and neutrons in each other. We sometimes call this isospin conservation sometimes, okay? Um, that's just a fancy word. Uh, but, but the number of protons doesn't have to be the same on each side, right? Because you can turn a proton to a neutron. Yes. Okay. Uh, lepton number. Uh, leptons are electrons and neutrinos. Also tiles, muons, and, and their corresponding neutrinos and antineutrinos. Um, uh, electrons and neutrinos have what we call a lepton number of one. The antiparticles have a lepton. Oh, that should be minus one, not zero, minus one. Uh, uh, minus one, okay. Yes, yeah, so go to this reaction. Left on number of one, left on number minus one, zero. Left on number on this side, zero, because there are no electrons or anything. So, so left on numbers are zero. So these are, of course, sometimes there's other things that we want to conserve, but these are things that really we want to, when we're looking at nuclear reactions, we want to make sure are conserved. Okay? All right. Excuse me. Yes, question. Yes. Why are we able to take energy from fusion uh, uh, and not from uh, fusion? Why are we able to take energy from? We can't take energy from fusion. It, um, the sun does it, right? Uh, now, now, if you're asking, can, can Mike Famiano take energy from fusion? No, I can't. Um, I don't have the machines to do it. Um, but uh, if we can, it would be fantastic. Um, let's see. In Europe, I believe the ITER facility was just closed down. In the United States, the National Ignition Facility facility is a thirty-foot billion-dollar ball, where they're actually trying to create what we call laser-induced fusion, where they're trying to fuse deuterons and tritium, or deuterons and deuterons. Um, um, ultimately, if we can do that. If we can get deuterons to fuse um, commercially, energy will be so cheap, uh, we'll have no choice but to give it away. Yes, oh. but I, I think uh, the heat is too much, so we cannot still manage to create fusion without uh, breaking everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we can do fusion, but, but usually we don't do that unless we want to destroy another yeah, country. Exactly. So, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess the question is, can we control fusion? Yeah. There's enough, by the way, it's a simple calculation. There's enough deuterium in, in uh, water so that if you were to use the water that rains on your house, there would be enough deuterium in there to power your house by fusion. Wow. Um, so I've heard that fusion energy is always 50 years away. Um, 50 years ago, fusion was 50 years away. So uh, today it's 50 years away. So we, we are hopeful. Okay, um, terminology, here's a little vocabulary, okay. a cross-section, you've probably heard the term cross-section, you've probably heard uh, sometimes when they talk about airplanes, they talk about radar cross-section, things like that, yeah, really like how, how big does it look, okay, how, um, think of, think of, uh, a beach ball and a, a football colliding, right? Yeah. It, 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 if the beach ball is bigger, there's a bigger chance that the football will hit it, right? Yeah. If the beach ball is really tiny, the football may not hit it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same principle in nuclear physics. In the quantum world of nuclear physics, it's a, it's a little trickier because you also have Coulomb forces and local strong forces mm -hmm. that come into play. So when you're scattering particles off each other, uh, um, they, they feel these forces between them. Yeah. It also depends on the energy, okay? But when we talk about cross-section, we really mean how big a target looks in a reaction. And by big, we do not mean obviously only the uh, mass uh, of the particle, but also the fields and... Uh, fields come into yeah. play, yep, yep. So everything... We, 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 can do, we can do tricks in quantum mechanics to calculate yes. it. So what are the units of cross-section, by the way? Uh, it's it's got to have units of area, right? Yeah. So it's units of area, right? 
cross-section units of area, so, okay? Very See, small. A very small cross-section would be, uh, um, uh, Professor Carabini, do you deal in nanobarns? Even lower. Even lower, yep, yep, yep. yep. Um, so so a, a big cross-section would be like what we call a barn. One barn is um, 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. Tiny. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and we do it with cross sections that are, you know, nano barns or Fermi Fermi squared, or so. Okay. Neutrino cross sections, uh, ten to the minus forty square square centimeters. Yeah. So they they are experts at neutrinos here. So neutrino cross sections are very very tiny. Yes. Okay. Uh, thermonuclear reaction rate. We use this symbol. This is just a cross section, yep, average, average value of cross section times the velocity. Things are moving around in a plasma. The thermonuclear reaction rate is how fast they are hitting each other on average. Yes? Um, it, it is mathematically, I believe, an expectation value, um, but it's really an average, and I'll show you how we get the average there. It's an average over all the velocities of all the particles. How we fuse them? Yeah. What's that? How we kill them? <laughs> because we define so many times that the average is the expectation value of some distribution for the next variable. Well, it's exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same reason. Okay. It's the average. You, you, you'll, hear me, you'll hear me use the term penetrability. Um, what that means is the probability that that two nuclei can overcome the Coulomb force between them. Okay, it, it means other things, but for the purposes of this class, uh, if I have a positive nucleus and another positive nucleus, they they repel each other, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. They have to be going fast enough to, be to overcome, overcome that Coulomb force. Okay, but it's also a quantum mechanical effect as well. Okay. They can do something called tunneling through that through that yeah, cool barrier. Yeah. All right. Yep. And then the nuclear reaction network is just a system of nuclear reactions in a plasma. If I have a plasma, what are all the nuclear reactions going on? Okay. Let me show you an example of a nuclear reaction network. Okay, what's on the left hand side here? Uh, You've seen it a thousand times already. Oh, the table of isotopes. Table of isotopes, all the way up to neon. Okay. This is an example of a nuclear reaction network. All of these arrows indicate a possible nuclear reaction that can turn one nucleus to another nucleus. Okay, so, so, so for example, uh, hydrogen can capture a neutron and become deuterium. Deuterium can capture a neutron and become tritium. For example, uh, um, a, a particle can capture an alpha particle and, and move up two, two units in both directions. A particle can capture a proton. There can be gammas. Uh, a photon may turn a particle back into a lighter particle. So all these reactions, we, we call that a reaction network. But we can actually, we can actually model these pretty easily. Okay. Um, uh, in a nuclear reaction network, we we have reactions that can create an isotope. Let's think about how you do that. What is this? This is a time derivative. Okay. How how fast does this isotope change? Okay. Well, it, these are all the reactions that create that isotope. It, you, you sum over all of the possible reactions. Okay. That create that isotope. See, I means that create that isotope. What does it depend on? Well, it, if if there's two particles that react. It, it depends on how many of them there are in the plasma. Yeah. The more particles I have, the more they are going to react. Yeah. And then it depends on the average rate that they react. Now, you can actually have another particle that decays to this particle. It undergoes radioactive decay. So the isotopes this decays into. Yeah, this is, this is a decay rate. Um, this is just the nuclear uh, decay law, right? Uh -huh. Dn dt is equal to n times gamma. Okay, right. Um, hard to see. I guess I should have used a different color. Um, um, yeah. I was thinking about green, white, and red because 
Italy, but white wouldn't have shown up. <laughs> you can also have three body reactions, which are a little difficult to model. AI. Yeah. Now, let me ask you what, what, what am I missing? Okay. I'll give you a hint. Look at the signs. Well, that's, that's um, the number of isotopes that decay from the state into another. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The number of reactions that destroy this, right? Destroy. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so, so I could have um, the same thing, but this thing reacts with another nucleus and destroys it, and it's a negative sign. Yeah. Yeah. This nucleus can decay, and it would be this, but a negative sign. And of course, it, there can be a three body. So if you think about it, I could have, you know, how many, how many, how many nuclei are in my reaction network? I, I don't know, maybe close to 50 or so. Um, I could have all the reactions between those nuclei, and I could have potentially hundreds, sometimes thousands of, of, of these uh, um, uh, differential equations. So it's a system of linear differential equations that I can uh, solve. And I solve it using a, a Jacobian matrix or something like that. I, we're very fortunate that for most of our nuclear reaction networks, the matrix is quite sparse. It's, it's, it's almost a diagonal matrix. Not quite. And the reason is, is because the most prominent reactions are proton and neutron captures. So it's like all the nuclei down the diagonal, this nucleus turns into himself, which, which means he doesn't react, but maybe he captures a proton and, and, and goes off diagonal by a little bit. Okay, let's talk a little more about nuclear reactions and how we change the reaction rates. Okay, how fast do reactions happen in a plasma? And this is how I think about it. This is, this is how my brain thinks about it. Um, the average reaction rate depends on the cross section, which also depends on the energy because we're dealing in the quantum world. Depends on the velocity distribution of particles and the kinetic energy of particles. I think of a nuclear plasma like a box of marbles. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, if if I shake the box, I, I'm I'm increasing the temperature. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I shake it faster. I'm increasing the temperature. The marbles move around faster. Yeah. And they collide. And they collide faster. Okay. If if I put bigger marbles in the box, I I, I increase the cross section and the rate increases, at least for the bigger marbles. If I, if, I, if I pack more marbles in the box, I increase the density. The marbles are closer together, they react. Okay? Let's talk about how that works. Let's talk about, first of all, the velocity of the marbles in the box, or the velocity of particles in a plasma. I heard someone mention it yesterday, in fact. How would we determine the velocity of particles in a plasma or, or in, in a gas? Uh, thermodynamics. 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 Yeah. thermodynamics. Energy was uh, three hertz uh, times the Boltzmann constant. Mm -hmm. that, that, that would be the average energy, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so we use what's called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the only thing you really want to remember about this, for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, you want to remember this exponent, okay? All right. It goes like the e to the minus v squared, all right? And then we multiply by v squared here because that's a, that's a, because uh, um, we live in three dimensions, that's a result of a three-dimensional universe. The energy between two particles is one half mv squared. This mass, by the way, is the reduced mass. It's it's like an average mass because you have two particles in the reaction, right? And, and they're both moving. Okay, so that v is a relative velocity. Okay, um, so that's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Here's a trivia question: where, where do we get helium for balloons? When what in the world does that have to do with Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution? <laughs> okay. What, what do you think? Where does helium come from? From the water. Uh, helium dissolved in water, maybe? Any other ideas? Um, exhalations from the soil. 
uh, uh, you're, you're right. I mean, you're from dirt, really. Um, uh, I used to think, well, we just get it from the air. I mean, helium's a gas. We should get it from the air, right? Um, it turns out that if we are to look at the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the, the speed of particles in a gas, helium looks like this. Okay? It's also not very dense. So it could rise in the atmosphere, but what's the escape velocity of Earth? Do you remember? Uh, 11.2 kilometers per second. So in the upper atmosphere, helium can have a pretty high velocity, even just a tail. Right? But the reason we have no helium or hydrogen in our atmosphere is because there's a segment of all of that that has an escape velocity that's higher than the escape velocity of the Earth. Okay. Eventually, eventually, it leaves the atmosphere, okay? oh, right. uh, for which I'm very thankful because hydrogen is extremely explosive. <laughs> <laughs> so we get helium um, from uh, uh, the fuel refining process, in fact. Uranium gives off helium, nuclear decay. Uh, it's difficult to get, and we are very worried about it because right now the world is getting low on helium. Professor Carabini, it affects your work tremendously, and it affects my work tremendously, because we use helium to cool our superconducting magnets. Right? This is important, though. It's important to know this, because we can figure out the probability, this is the probability that a particle, any gas or a plasma, has a certain velocity. And that's how we get the average velocity. I'm going to show you one more figure, and then we'll be done. And the reason we'll be done is because my laptop battery is at 15%. Question? It uh, looks like a Gauss distribution. Yeah, it's very close to a Gauss Poisson. distribution. I think it's Poisson. It's been a while since I had to use a Poisson, but V squared times an exponent of minus V squared. So uh, V squared, of course, looks like that, right? Yeah. Minus V squared looks like that, and when you multiply them together, you get something that looks, looks like that. Okay. All right, let me show you one figure. Um, it's a tridimensional yeah. function. Yeah. This is a typical figure here of the um, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution at different temperatures. We measure temperature in MEV too. Okay. Up, up here, this is 10 billion degrees Kelvin. Okay. Down here, one billion degrees Kelvin. So, so um, up at the top of temperature, it's ten billion. Down at the bottom, it's one one billion or so. So, this is about the temperature range of of um, the the explosive shock in a supernova, or what we call the neutrino driven wind. Okay, um, and this is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution for say protons and neutrons here. Their velocity. Take a look, it's velocity over the speed of light. So, so, so they, they, they can move pretty fast, depending on temperature. And of course, you see when it's real high, high temperature, you see that this has a larger tail to it. OK? If we're looking at something like, say, the, the core of the sun or, or the photosphere, the, the temperatures are more like tens of thousands of Kelvin. Um, uh, you see the velocity is much smaller. Okay, but 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 you can still still plot the probability. Okay, so we use a probability that particles in a plasma have a certain velocity. Multiply that by their cross sections. We can figure out the average cross section. Okay, which we will do tomorrow. <laughs> have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>
Ciao a tutti ragazzi. Ciao.